Yeah. No, I got it. it. Was. No. So, okay. yep, I think you can start whenever you want. Good morning, everyone. If you have a hard time hearing me, please let me know. Um, I've got the thicker mask on today. So it's so wonderful to see you at our last um, seminar for the, for the, I was going to say the season, but we also call these things semesters. Um, we are all, I think, due for a very nice break, um, particularly the students who've been working hard as they finalize their uh, semester. So we're so happy to have um, Horacio Duarte with us today. Just a couple quick announcements. We are scheduling for the spring semester, so please do keep sending those suggestions. Uh, we have received several and we are working actively to get them on the schedule. So in that vein, I'd like to, um, if, if for, the first, for those of you who are in the room, I'd just like to point out Katie Gunderson in the back who has been such a fantastic addition. Yay, round of applause. To this seminar series uh, and also Jeff Johnson, of course, year after year, pulling these things together, particularly as we uh, foray into these uh, dual modes of presenting. So thank you, Jeff, as well. Fantastic. Um, so I am here to introduce Horacio, but I'm going to start with our land acknowledgments. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. So welcome again. Dr. Duarte is a pediatric infectious disease physician scientist with expertise in decision science, infectious disease modeling, and epidemiology. From that, you can see how well he fits within our group. So we're so thankful to have him here. His research focuses on developing simulation models to evaluate HIV treatment and prevention strategies for adults, children, and pregnant people, primarily in resource-limited settings. So that was the introduction that he gave us to read to you. But really, I want to say a couple of things about Horacio. Horacio, if you may or may not know, was a walk-on to the Harvard tennis team as an undergraduate, <laughs> a walk-on. And he has some fantastic stories about um, playing tennis at Harvard, including one story about how he once played Larry Summer uh, in tennis and how that went. As you can imagine, maybe you know the ending as to how that went. So um, we are- Some of us don't know who Larry Summer is. <laughs> the sorry, former- the Does form everyone else know? Oh, sorry. The oh, former okay. president of Harvard, oh, okay. who actually- Former secretary, secretary of the president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so someday, um, please do ask him about that story. It's quite entertaining. <laughs> At least I found it was, um, especially as a tennis player. So it is so wonderful to have youth and new ideas and forward thinking um, people here. But I, I wanna re remind us old folks that youth isn't everything. So can we get the photo please? <laughs> so this is Horacio after taking on Dr. Sherwood and I in tennis and he's bent over on trying to catch his breath. And so just a quick reminder to us old folks that youth isn't exactly everything. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. He, he he is actually bent over, but it, it's because we had just started playing. He smoked us. Not only did he smoke us, it was two against one. Like Nancy and I would alternate in and out, and he still smoked us. And at the end, he started giving us tips on how to play better, so which we loved, by the way. So we look forward to that again. Um, again, so happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Just one i will go ahead and start it here for you since I'm here. Okay. Awesome. All right, Thank thanks. You. All right, good morning, everyone. It's it's great to see so many people here, and thanks for coming at, or or joining by Zoom. Um, 
So as Ruby explained, my, um, my research methods wise focuses on developing simulation based models to then evaluate various health policies. And as a pediatric ID doctor, I focus on HIV. And uh, within HIV, there's a few different populations I focus on. Um, when I started this work several years ago, I started working on uh, focusing on adults, optimizing treatment and prevention. Um, and I have ongoing work in this area funded by a, a K01 from NIAD. Um, a few years later, because I, I am pediatric, um, I adapted that model to, to build a pediatric model so that we could look at optimizing um, health outcomes for children living with HIV. And then what I've been up to uh, a lot over the last year and a half is, is adapting prior models to build uh, a model where we can evaluate interventions focused on prevention of mother and child transmission of HIV. And so you'll hear me today say the acronym PMTCT, so that's what that means. And, and this has been possible thanks to a, a nice grant from the, the Pharma Foundation. Um, so since most people are not super familiar with, with HIV, I'll start with a few uh, major stats. So as of uh, 2021, according to UNAID statistics, um, there were 38 million people worldwide living with HIV. Among all of those, 1.7 million of them are children. Most of them presumably acquired the infection from their mothers. And um, the part of the world that has the most people living with HIV is, is Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a major focus of my research and, and the work I'll be sharing with you today. The good news is we've made a lot of progress over the last two decades. So what this is showing is that um, starting in 2000, uh, every year there were a, a little under 500,000 uh, children infected who became infected with HIV. Um, and that has steadily declined so that by 2016, we have a little under 200,000 children becoming infected with HIV. This is thanks to the steady scale up of, um, of providing medications to mothers living with HIV uh, that are meant to prevent transmission to, to newborns. Um, so these orange bars represent the proportion of uh, HIV positive pregnant women who receive some sort of prophylaxis. But there's still more work to be done. So the, this figure on the right is the same information, but now from 2010 to 2020, uh, we see that the number of infant infections has continued to decline. Uh, by, by, as of 2020, there were about 110,000 annual uh, infant infections. Um, but you might note that the rate at which the decline is happening has started to plateau. We'll talk about why that might be. Um, and there are many different interventions that are aimed towards PMTCT, but one huge um, challenge we face is that there are limited resources. So we have limited resources in the US, but especially in the settings where uh, HIV is most prevalent, prevalent. So we can't just throw the kitchen sink at it. Ideally, we need to find ways to evaluate which interventions have the highest um, population level effectiveness and cost effectiveness so that we can prioritize those. And today I'll show you how you can use simulation-based models to do that. So today um, I'll start out with some general background on PMTCT. I'll talk about what simulation-based models are and um, why we might want to use them. And then I'm so excited that uh, I have some very hot off the press uh, preliminary results for a couple of, of strategies. Um, the first category is uh, strategies aimed at optimizing something called viral load testing. And the second is a type of intervention called mentor mothers. So for background on PMTCT, a good place to start is by understanding how it is that a newborn can acquire HIV from their mom. So there's two main periods of uh, potential exposure. The first is the, the peripartum period. This includes uh, not only the labor and delivery process, but we also know that during the last few weeks of pregnancy, HIV can be transmitted to, to the infant. And in the absence of any intervention, from many studies, we know that the probability of the newborn acquiring HIV during this period is around 25 to 33%. Second period is through breastfeeding in the postpartum period, which can last upwards to 18 months long or sometimes longer. And from various studies, um, there are estimates showing that over 18 months, there's a 9% cumulative probability of the infant acquiring HIV. This comes out roughly to about 0.6 to 0.9% risk per month. 
And you may be wondering um, why, why is this a problem? Because you may be aware that in the US and other high income settings, if uh, a mom has HIV, uh, the very strong recommendation is to not breastfeed, to just eliminate that risk altogether. Uh, the, the problem in the settings we're talking about today is that there are high rates of infant mortality due to diarrheal disease. And breastfeeding provides tremendous amounts of protection to reduce that mortality. So this is some nice data from a, a meta-analysis from a couple of decades ago. So as an example, in the first two months of life, uh, with breastfeeding, there's a six-fold reduction in mortality from inf infectious disease. So experts agreed strongly early on that uh, the, the guidelines should recommend breastfeeding despite the risk of uh, transmission of HIV to the baby. And today we know that the, the best overall intervention for PMTCT is providing moms with uh, what's called ART, which stands for antiretroviral therapy. So ART is what someone living with HIV should receive um, as soon as possible to treat their HIV. It consists of, of a combination of three, uh, usually of three different antiretroviral drugs. Um, and we also have a lot of data showing now that if, if you start ART early and uh, are successful in achieving viral suppression, meaning that you, you get the, the levels of the virus in the body very low, that the, the risk of peripartum transmission can be pretty close to zero. Uh, so this is some really nice data from France um, where they stratified the risk by viral load as well as by timing of ART initiation. So just to give you an idea, uh, for moms that um, had already started ART prior to conception and had their, their viral load suppressed below 50 copies per milliliter, uh, the risk was then essentially zero. Um, for those who initiated ART in the third trimester and had viral load above 400, the risk was 4.4, uh, so still a uh, 4.4% so chance. Um, so much lower than 33%, but still uh, not zero. Um, but the risk can still be a little bit higher. So there's, this is data from another study where they were able to stratify risk um, with more granularity at unsuppressed levels. So for example, if the viral load was above 10,000, the risk was 9.2%. So still lower than 33%, but still pretty high. So this really emphasizes the importance of not only starting ART, but making sure that you're achieving viral suppression. And if we come back to this slide showing uh, progress, there's more, there's more to the story here. So um, policies for when to start ART have been evolving rapidly over the last two decades. And it really wasn't, it wasn't until 2013 that WHO recommended that ART should be started uh, right away for uh, pregnant women who have HIV. A few years later, um, the guidelines expanded to say that everyone with HIV should start on treatment right away. The reason for this is that um, for a long time, there was a lot of debate about when patients should start on treatment because of concern, potential side effects, drug resistance. So um, clinicians waited until their CD4 count, which is the marker of their immune system, dropped below a certain level. So until 2013, the only really strategy that was used was not full ART. It was these short course single drug regimens. So basically the mom received a dose or two of one medication uh, that was found to uh, reduce the risk of transmission by down to a third. So that was helpful in preventing transmission of the baby um, not as effective as art, and it did nothing for the health of the mom. And in more recent times, back to this, uh, this plateau that we've seen in the decrease, um, there are many potential reasons for this. One could be that as we've increased art coverage, meaning the proportion of pregnant women that are, that are receiving art, we've, we've gotten to pretty high levels, not all the way to 100%, and it may be that closing the gap on that last mile, those people that we haven't been reaching might be harder to reach. Um, another potential reason may be that even amongst uh, women that get started on ART, not all of them are achieving viral suppression and that um, improving outcomes in that sense and in, in getting better viral suppression uh, is harder to do than just starting more people on ART. But it's clear that as an overall intervention, ART is, is what we need. But when you, when you look at the whole 
process, it becomes clear that art is not just one intervention. You really need a lot of different interventions for art to be given effectively. So first, you, you need to know your status. So you need to know you have HIV, you need to get tested. Then you need to have access to art and be willing to initiate it. Then you need to remain uh, on art, ideally for the rest of your life, but um, for sure throughout pregnancy and the postpartum period. So you need to remain in care. And from various studies, we know that by one to two years postpartum, um, around 25% of, of mothers become lost to follow-up. So they're no longer taking the treatment. Um, then even if you remain in care, we need to make sure that um, it's successful, that you're achieving viral suppression and maintaining it over a long period of time. And we also know that by one to two years postpartum, about 20% of women um, are not, have not achieved viral suppression. It's worth noting that despite whatever these numbers look like, in men, the cascade of care looks, looks even worse. Um, so this is actually pretty good compared to men. Um, and today I'm gonna to share uh, simulations from a, a couple of different interventions. So the first uh, focuses on improving viral load, something called viral load testing. That has the ability to, uh, among patients who have unsuppressed viral load, to identify it so that we can then get them resuppressed. And the second category is something called mentor mothers, which has the potential to not only uh, improve rates of retention, but also to improve uh, rates of viral suppression overall. And um, I mentioned that the, the, the big challenge are the limited resources. So we have to identify the ones that are most cost effective. And, um, and so simulation-based models can help us do that. But this room is full of epidemiologists. So you may be wondering, why aren't we just using uh, a randomized controlled trial? So RCTs are, are obviously great. They're particularly um, convenient or, or feasible for looking at intermediate outcomes. So in the case of HIV, we're talking about uh, interventions or the outcome you can look at is, does this improve rates of retention and care for, for women? Does this improve rates of viral suppression? But the, the outcome we're ultimately interested in is uh, finding meaningful differences in the number of infant infections. And so you can imagine how that's going to require a much larger sample size that may be difficult uh, to achieve. Um, if for those of you cardiovascular folks uh, listening, uh, uh, a good analogy might be you might have a couple of interventions um, and your large sample size is big enough to find uh, differences in cardiovascular events. But despite your ridiculously large sample size, you still may not have enough power to look at differences in mortality. So this is kind of what we're talking about here. And then if, if you also, and that's just comparing two interventions, if you also account for the fact that you, you're considering 10 different interventions, that's only going to increase the size of, of a study that you might need. So it gets, it's very logistically challenging and, and expensive. Um, so in general, the three main reasons why we use simulation-based models is when, when an empirical real-life study um, is either one, too expensive or logistically challenging, uh, two, the time horizon you need is too long. So for example, if your question is, how long does it take for this strategy to eliminate HIV? You might be waiting 30 or 40 years. So, um, uh, and even here, our time horizon is two to three years. It's still the simulation uh, aspect still is very helpful there because you can get the information you need faster. And uh, perhaps the, the experiment, if there's an experiment you'd ideally run that's unethical, that's another area where simulation-based models can be helpful. So that's a bit of the motivation of why we use simulation-based models. Now, what, what are they actually? And so the first thing to understand is a simulation-based model is a, a mathematical model, which is an entirely different animal than statistical models, which most epidemiologists, which that's what most people are used to. So these are a few slides uh, that I show in the first week of the class I teach on mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. And so here I argue that simulation-based modeling is a, a type of epidemiologic method, but it's it's separate or different from classical epidemiology. And what I'm calling classical epi here are where you're, you're trying to better understand something and you do it by observing real life. So you have a well-designed study, whether it's a, a clinical trial, a cohort study or some other study design. And by observing real life, you collect data 
you end up with some data set, and then you apply some statistical model to draw some conclusions, interpret what the data means. This could be a t-test, a linear regression, GEE, what have you. Um, but that's very different from, from what I do. So here, we're not observing real life. We're actually simulating real life. And in terms of the model we use, we don't use a statistical model. We use a simulation-based model, and that's what does the simulation. So here, we're not trying to interpret data. We're, we're sort of making uh, predictions about what certain strategies will look like so that we can make well-informed decisions about, about health policies. So that probably still sounds uh, pretty abstract. So let me give you a sort of a classic infectious disease example. This is what's referred to as an SIR model. So imagine you have this small community population. Uh, these blue dots signify people who are susceptible to measles. So they haven't been vaccinated. They haven't been infected with measles. And then suddenly you drop in one infectious person here in red. Measles is extremely contagious. So they're going to infect their neighbors. Those neighbors are going to infect their neighbors and so on and so forth. And then the people that became infected early on are going to recover first. And because of the way measles works, um, they're going to develop immunity that should be lifelong, and so they'll be protected. Um, and it turns out that we can uh, represent, model, simulate this complex series of events with uh, a series of mathematical uh, equations. And so your output might look something like this, where over time you can keep track of how many people are either susceptible, infected, or recovered. And then you can play around with this. So you can see, well, if we did nothing, what would happen? And if we start to throw in different interventions, what will uh, the outcomes look like? And the other piece about how these two worlds are related is not only are they both types of epi methods, but they also have a, a particular relationship with each other, which is that um, simulation-based modeling cannot be done without results from a wide range of, of classical uh, epi studies. So in a simulation-based model, you're simulating a whole system of complicated events. And so that, that becomes very uh, data-hungry in the sense that there are a lot of different parameters and assumptions, and they have those assumptions have to come from somewhere. So I'll show you some examples in a little bit as I walk you through my, my PMTCT model. So we'll start big picture. So this, this model that uh, I developed, um, the, the term that's used to categorize this type of model is a, a micro simulation. Another term for that is an individual based stochastic model. Um, there's a, a ton of computer programming involved. So the, this model has a bunch of different functions adding up to thousands of lines of code. We use MATLAB, which is popular amongst engineers and applied math people, but we could have used R or Python or C++. Um, and the good thing is for this model, I, I didn't have to start from scratch because I had previously developed a, a, a model for adults um, so that I was able to leverage that. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So um, in terms of this individual-based business, um, what that means is that we represent, unlike some other types of uh, models, we represent people as actual individuals. So each column, one, two, three, four, represents a person, a hypothetical person in the model. And for each person, we assign a long list of individual level characteristics that we care about. So here we have age, HIV status, CD4 cell count, viral load, whether or not you're on treatment, and there are more. Um, and a good way to try to wrap your head around the model is to think of a, a 3D matrix of information. So this table uh, shows what the people in the model look like at one snapshot in time. You have the x-axis are the people, the y-axis are their characteristics. Um, but we're simulating events over a lot, relatively long period of time. So this model works in monthly time cycles. So as time moves forward each month, the model reevaluates uh, what the values are for these characteristics for each person. And so that's where this third Z axis going into the page comes in, where you can imagine like this table and a series of tables into the page where uh, the values of these characteristics change. And so to build this model, as I said, I adapted this adult model. So that, that model was meant to represent um, transmission of HIV in the uh, entire Kenyan population. 
So it included the approximately 5% of people living with HIV, as well as the other 95% of people that didn't have HIV. And the model did three main things. The first um, is that it, it simulated in each individual with HIV, disease progression and treatment. So what that means is that we know with HIV, in the absence of treatment, it attacks something called your CD4 T cells, which is a part of your immune system. So that's this, this blue line here. Over time, it's gonna become lower and lower. And we know from many studies that the lower your CD4 count is, the higher your risk of opportunistic infections and death is. And then once you go on treatment, that helps your CD4 count recover, thereby decreasing the risk of these bad things happening. Then the second part is uh, we simulate sexual partnerships between people, and this can include partnerships, discordant couples, so meaning uh, one person who's infected and one person who's not infected. So we simulate uh, the, pro the transmission of HIV where the risk is informed by people's viral load and, and other things. And then third, this is a part that I spent a lot of time uh, developing was um, uh, simulating in individuals the possibility of um, the emergence of drug resistance and then the, the transmission of that drug resistance to other people. For the PMTCT model, we leveraged mainly this individual component amongst people who have HIV and then made a bunch of additions in order to uh, be able to look at PMTCT issues. So this included things like uh, modeling uh, the, the probability of a woman becoming pregnant based on fertility rates, accounting for what proportion of, of women breastfeed, um, what's the probability of transmission of HIV to the infant when they're born and during breastfeeding, a number of things related to the cascade of care that's specific to PMTCT. And then also, uh, because now we're explicitly modeling birth, we have to account for maternal mortality related to, to birth. So that's, that's kind of the big picture. And now I'll walk you through a little bit of what happens uh, month to month in, in the model. So um, as I mentioned, the model works in these monthly time cycles. So what that means is every month for each person in the model, it's going to assess whether a series of events that we care about either happen or don't happen. Uh, but first, I want to just make clear who it is we're modeling. So whereas in uh, prior projects where I looked at transmission amongst adults, and, and there I had this open population, we have the whole population, uh, HIV positive and not HIV positive. Where the strategies I'm gonna show you today, we're able to simplify things and just include uh, a cohort, in this case of 100,000 women who very recently became infected with HIV and, and just became pregnant. So that means that for this model, there's no need to simulate um, HIV incidence in, adult, in women, and there's no need to, to simulate fertility rates. Now, these are things that are work in progress adding to the model because there are other interventions I'm, I'm looking at that focus on things like uh, primary prevention through pre-exposure prophylaxis, how often should we be retesting during pregnancy and, and postpartum, and um, uh, meeting the unmet need for contraception. But this one keeps things a bit simple. So we'll start with month one. For each person in the model, we're gonna, we're gonna ask, does this person die this month? And so in the model, you can die either from, in general, either from HIV or from anything else. So you look at background mortality rates. So for HIV, as I said, the, the biggest predictor of mortality is your CD4 count, which is something that we keep track of. Um, and so let's say, and, and so I mentioned this is a, a stochastic model. So that means that things operate based on probabilities as, as opposed to deterministic rates. So over and over again, for all these events I'm, I'm sharing with you, each time there's an event in question, um, we use a, a random number generator. It generates a random number between zero and one. It's kind of like flipping a coin, but it's, instead of being at 50-50, it can compare it to any probability. So let's say we know that this month, the probability of HIV-related death for this person is 0 0.002. And then you sort of roll the dice, and the random number comes up with 0 0.43. That's bigger than the probability in question, so the event doesn't happen. Had it been 0 0.001, then this person, person would have died of HIV at this month. So, but this person does not die of HIV. So then we assess, well, did they die of, um, of other causes? 
And so for that, we turn to uh, sources like uh, UN World Population Prospect. There are a number of, of demographic sources where we can get age and sex specific background mortality rates. We of course have to uh, subtract out the component of those deaths that are attributable to HIV so that we're not double counting HIV deaths. We come up with a monthly probability. And so then <laughs> we do that for all 100,000 women in the cohort. And then we move on to the next set of events in that month. So we might be interested in, did this person uh, reach the antenatal care clinic yet? And if so, did they get tested for HIV? Did they start treatment? And we might ask, if they're on treatment, is it working? So is, is, is their viral load coming down? So if it's working, uh, we, the viral load comes down by a certain amount based on studies that inform that, their CD4 count goes up by a certain amount. If it's not working, their viral load remains high and their CD4 count continues to drop, which then for next time uh, modulates the risk of mortality. If they're on art, are they still in care? So, um, so each of these parameters requires looking at, at real life data from studies that are specifically designed to answer, to, to get estimates for these, for these things. And so there's really, there's no, one of the most common questions I get is what uh, was your data set? And there's this idea that there's this like nice little data set. And I think there's, this, sometimes there's a misconception that we're doing like machine learning or something. So there's no data, there is no data set. There's a bunch of parameters and we just have to find out what the values of those parameters are. And they can come from a wide range. It can be a clinical trial, a cohort study, demographic and health surveys. And finding out the value of each parameter oftentimes is like doing a mini meta-analysis because you might have five studies that inform that parameter. And then you have to look at them and see, okay, what should our base case estimate be? And then what are the range of values we wanna explore when we, when we do sensitivity analysis? And then once all of these events are evaluated for all 100,000 women in the cohorts, we then move to month two and you rinse, rinse wash and repeat. And you keep moving through, and then things here start to get more interesting in month 10. Um, so that's a 40 weeks gestation. For, for our purposes here, we assume all the births happen then. And then you have to start accounting for, uh, did this newborn become infected with HIV yet this month? And so um, at birth, that's infected by uh, probability related to peripartum transmission and postpartum breastfeeding it's informed by values related to that. And the risk is stratified based on the mom's art status, their viral load, and their CD4 count. All right, so um, now I can start to set up the, the preliminary results. Um, so again, the two categories of strategies are um, optimizing viral load testing. We'll talk about what that actually is. And, uh, and mentor mothers. So again, there are many things you need to do to give art effectively. And one of them is to achieve and maintain viral suppression. So improving viral load testing can help um, improve these kinds of outcomes here. And so WHO puts out guidelines for how often viral load testing should happen. But first, what is it? So you're taking a blood sample from the patient, essentially to see how much virus is in the plasma. And there's a term that we use that you've probably already heard me use, which is viral suppression or you're suppressed. So that's good. That means that the treatment is doing what it should. It makes the, the level of the virus go down. And, and typically um, when something is suppressed, it's this binary thing where uh, you have some continuous value of what the viral load is, but if it's below a certain level, like 400 copies per mil, we say it's suppressed. But if it's the whole point of this is that if it is unsuppressed, then we're able to know that and it's an opportunity to intervene in some way and then reachieve or achieve for the first time viral suppression. The two main reasons someone might have unsuppressed viral load are either uh, low adherence, so they're not taking the medication as regularly as they should. You're supposed to take it every day. And the second is uh, they either started with drug resistance or they've developed drug resistance and developing drug resistance is closely tied to, to poor adherence. And so WHO provides guidance on how often you should uh, check a viral load. And so once you start in general for adults and for children, once you start ART six months later, 
you should um, check a viral load. If you're if you're unsuppressed, if you're suppressed, if everything looks good, then you check again at 12 months, and then every 12 months thereafter. If you're not suppressed, in the U.S., what we would do is you'd get a drug resistance test, so you know right away because that that's the big concern. Um, currently, in most of these settings. Um, Drug resistance testing is not available because it's too expensive. So what happens is you provide um, intensified adherence counseling for the patient to say, well, if you don't have drug resistance, um, better adherence should fix things. And then you recheck in three months. And if it's still unsuppressed and, and you think the patient has been having better adherence, then it's probably due to drug resistance. And then you switch to what's called second line regimen. So you switch up the, the, the cocktail um, so that you don't have, so if they had drug resistance, you have a new regimen that they should not have resistance to. Um, but in general, not just for pregnancy, but for adults, um, a huge problem is that uh, for all intents and purposes, viral load testing isn't really achieving what it was supposed to achieve in the first place, um, which is that there's this huge delay, even, even if people get the tests, get the second test, and you confirm uh, treatment failure because you need two unsuppressed tests to confirm biologic failure. There are these huge delays in actually switching to the second line regimen. So these three things have to happen. First, you have to have the first test be unsuppressed. Get the second test where if you're unsuppressed, it's biologic failure, and then you're supposed to switch. But uh, um, there have been lots of studies showing that there are huge delays. And then um, earlier this year, this really nice meta-analysis came out that's, that showed impressively the mean delay in switching from the time you confirm, from the time you're supposed to switch is about a year and a half. In some cases, it can be upwards of, of three years. And so that's not good in general, but if you think of the, the, the timeline for pregnancy and postpartum, that's really bad. So viral load testing uh, for pregnancy um, there's more at stake because we're not just talking about the health of the mother. There's also the possibility of transmission to the, to the baby. And so there's a couple of problems. Uh, people recently have been talking a lot about the fact that um, the guidelines might be fine for adults in general, but they don't really provide that much additional guidance uh, in, the, in the case of pregnancy and postpartum periods. That, and, but even if you accept that, the issue is that even those guidelines aren't really being followed, which, which creates the sort of a preventable situation where there's a high risk of transmission. So um, for viral load testing, I'm going to walk you through some scenarios we, we simulated. Um, so the first scenario is just the status quo. And because the, um, the delay to switching is so long, for, for our purposes here, we just assume that basically viral load testing just doesn't happen, period. There's no switching. The second scenario, we modeled perfect adherence to guidelines. So all the tests happen when they're supposed to. And then if, if the results call for switching, the switching happens on time. And then for all of the things I'm going to show you, um, the time horizon is 28 months long. So that includes the 10 months of uh, till delivery during pregnancy, an additional 18 months of breastfeeding in the postpartum period. And then over the course of 28 months, um, the cumulative probability, we assume a constant rate of these things happening, but the cumulative probability of loss to follow-up is 25%. And uh, for having an unsuppressed viral load, it's 20%. Um, and so here are our results with, with absolute numbers. So this is this first one is our status quo. The second one is the perfect switch. Um, so just a little orientation. The, the number of births here you see is uh, 98,000 something. We started with 100,000 women. So the reason there are less births is that not all the mothers survived uh, until the time of delivery. And then um, over here, we have total infant infections throughout over the time horizon. So of these 98,927 births, there were um, 11,000 of them approximately. Um, that acquired HIV. And then these columns give the breakdown of how many of them came from the postpartum period as opposed to the peripartum period. But what I want to focus a little bit more on is um, of this perfect switching, what the, the relative reduction in the number of infant infections is. So overall, 
it reduced uh, the number of infections by 6.1%. Um, the, the impact was bigger in the postpartum period because you can imagine uh, if, you're not, if you're not checking a viral load test until six months, let's say, and you're not going to switch until nine months and then delivery happens at 10 months, there's not enough time for this to have a big impact on the peripartum period, but it has a more time to, to kick in for the postpartum period. We also looked, okay, so then um, there's, for all of this, there's still lots of work to be done, lots of things to tweak, but um, we still need to do a cost-effectiveness analysis of this because what we're proposing here isn't some new intervention. This is basically just, what if we actually followed the guidelines? But there's, there's a, a number of reasons that are probably context specific for why the, the guidelines are not being followed. Um, and there are various hypothetical interventions that still need to be created to help adherence to these guidelines. But there's a good chance that whatever they are, they're gonna cost some money. So we need to look at how much could the intervention cost and still be cost-effective. And that can help uh, implementation scientists give them an idea of like, well, we can't come up with this Cadillac intervention, but we can come up with this other thing that could still be cost-effective. <clears throat> we then uh, modeled another scenario that's going to be a little bit more controversial, which is uh, we call an immediate switch. So instead of waiting for the second unsuppressed viral load to call it virologic failure and switch, we say, um, you know, because the timeline we're looking at is pretty short, Let's, let's get things going right away. Um, so basically, after one unsuppressed viral load, you switch regimens. There's still a lot of things to hash out here. Um, uh, there's, there's some assumptions that are being made that we'll look at more closely. But um, let me walk you through how this, how this helps. So let's say that uh, a, a woman recently infected with HIV becomes pregnant here. And oftentimes it's not till month two that they present to antenatal care. And that's when they find out they have HIV. So if they get a viral load test six months later at month eight, uh, and they're unsuppressed, the baby's born here in month 10, uh, they don't find out the switch that needs to happen doesn't happen until after the baby's born. So you've missed out on this opportunity to improve the, to lower the viral load to reduce the risk of peripartum transmission. Um, whereas with an immediate switch, um, it would still take a little time for the viral load to come down a lot, but, but there is some time, there's a, a couple months for things to take effect. Um, and for any uh, HIV experts in the audience, I failed to mention here, we're, we're still assuming that we're using a Favrens based art because that's what we have the most data with. We've recently started switching to something called dolutegravir based art, which introduces a whole other set of issues, which if there's questions, I can, I can talk about in the Q&A. Um, so here, for these two, a uh, perfect switch versus an immediate switch, the immediate switch has a, a, a greater overall reduction in the, in the number uh, of infections, uh, 6.1 versus 9.4. Um, it, has, it has a bigger impact in both periods of time, but it's, it's bigger in the, in the peripartum period because you're making that switch earlier. So you're actually having an impact on the birth. Okay, that brings us to mentor mothers. So mentor mothers, there are many different uh, uh, flavors of this intervention. And, and there are people out there who, who this is actually what they study on the ground. Um, but essentially um, you, you identify uh, women who are in PMTCT care and are, are known to have really good adherence and, and they're eager to provide uh, adherence counseling and other forms of support to their peers. And studies have shown that this has the potential to uh, decrease rates of loss of follow-up and amongst women who are, who are in care on art, it can also reduce the rates of biologic failure. So, in the scenarios I'm going to show you, we assumed that this decreased loss to follow up from the 25% we were assuming down to 10%, and that it reduced failure from 20% to 10%. And so here we see much bigger effects. So overall, you have a almost 30% reduction in the number of infections compared to the 6 and the 9%. Um, it has a big effect in both the peripartum and postpartum period. 
So what's happening here is your the the intervention is having an effect on more people because the, the viral load testing it helps, but really where it helps is just women who who failed. It helps identify them and then get them back on track. What this is doing is that it's it's keeping first more people in care. So in the other scenario, you have large loss of follow up rates. So um, they're just dropping out. They're not on the they're not on ARC period. And then the other thing Mentor Mothers does is on top of in, increasing the number of people who stay on ARC in care, it's reducing the number that fail in the first place. So the viral load testing stuff is more downstream and helping sort of a, a lower proportion of people. Um, and then we also looked at some combinations of things. So these, these two things in the box were mentor mother combined either with perfect testing as it stands now, or uh, in the bottom, um, uh, mentor mother with immediate switch. And they have similar uh, levels of, of reduction in infection around 33. Uh, percent. So you'll notice that the effects aren't additive. So if you, you might think, oh, 30% plus 9%, you'll get 39%. But basically what's happening is one of the interventions is doing the good work and then it reduces the impact that the other one can have. Um, for those of you that like number needed to treat, um, here's all the interventions. So for mentor mother, you need to treat 30 to prevent one infant infection. It's a bit higher for perfect testing, 146. But if you compare it to, to say statins, it looks pretty good. So I think the data is that you need to treat 60 people with statins to prevent one heart attack and 268 to prevent one stroke. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been talking about these relative reductions, um, but I also want to be clear that this doesn't mean a 30% reduction for mentor mother of all infant infections. It's of those that this intervention can have an impact on. So let me talk about that a little bit. So this, these stacked bars, there were 110 infection, 110,000 infections in, in children worldwide in 2021. And this breaks down some uh, aspects of them. So in the top, you have children that were infected during the peripartum period. In the bottom, you have children that were infected during the breastfeeding period. And then this kind of yellow green color, those are the moms in either category that just didn't get art, period. So the interventions I talked about today will have zero impact on those women because you have to get them on art first. Um, but otherwise, these interventions um, will have an impact on, on the rest of this population with a small caveat that in these simulations that I showed, uh, the women were already infected with HIV just before pregnancy started. So some of these bars represent women who uh, they did go on art, but they didn't become infected until during the pregnancy or during breastfeeding. And so these are things that we're um, further developing in the model so that we can actually look at, at those populations as well. So next steps, as I mentioned, for all of these, uh, we're going to incorporate costs to see how cost effective they are, because you might have one intervention that looks way better, but the extra incremental cost of that intervention may be uh, a bit steep and, and maybe not affordable. Um, and we're, there's a lot of fun additions to the model we're making so that we can look at these other interventions. So everything today, we talked about basically women who already have HIV trying to prevent transmission, but there's more upstream things where if you prevent women from getting infected in the first place, that can also have an that also has an impact on PMTCT. So things like pre-exposure prophylaxis. Another thing of big interest is this concept of how often do we need to, you know, a, a woman comes into the antenatal care clinic and they test negative for HIV, but you may want to keep testing at certain time periods. Uh, because pregnancy and postpartum is a, is a very high risk uh, time period for biological reasons. So per sexual contact, the risk of uh, HIV acquisition uh, during pregnancy and postpartum is higher than other times. And so um, there are various studies trying to, to tease out how often, you know, we can't test every month, we don't have enough money for that, but what's the sweet spot? Um, and then, of course, um, not just in HIV, but outside of HIV, there's, there's um, 
uh, efforts to try to meet the unmet need for contraception. And this can have an impact on PMTCT um, as well. And so uh, I, I'm looking forward to eventually being able to, to compare many different types of interventions so that we can see which ones should be prioritized. Um, and I think that's it. So uh, I want to say a big thank you to my team members without whom this uh, wouldn't be possible. So uh, Jeanette Karenbaum has been working super hard over the last year and a half to help me uh, develop this model. And, and especially in the last few months, uh, we we're kind of racing against the clock to try to get this ready for today. Um, David Stoffer has been working with me for the last seven years. He's a programming genius. I, I wouldn't be able to do this without him. Uh, big thank you to my K1 mentor, Dr. Eva Enns. And I got a lot of great input from different people. So uh, Eva leads a, a decision analysis interest group that I got to present at a couple times to get some feedback. And uh, my colleagues, Jimmy Carlucci and Dennis Gudera have been great in providing feedback and also to, to my funder and my, my K01 and, and Pharma Foundation. So I'm uh, happy to take some questions. The sexual transmission of HIV, we typically talk about adherence as about 90 to 95%. Is it the same for um, um, transmission from mother to child? Let me see if I understand the question. So the, in, in sexual partnership transmission, adherence, uh, what do you mean by adherence? We typically talk about good adherence at a practical level, meaning 90 to 95% oh, adherence. Yes. Is it the same for? Um, in, in general, yes. So it, in general, so the, the thing, okay, so what we know is that um, higher adherence is better than lower adherence. It's difficult to my knowledge, it's difficult to have super granular data on like this level of adherence versus this level of adherence right. gives you this probability of failure developing drug resistance. Yeah. It seems to me that one of the most urgent questions that the world needs to know isn't on the list where your, your data could do a lot of good. And that is um, with the introduction of injectable and particularly the phase three trial at the moment for six month injectables, that would seem to me to be a real potential game changer for the for mother to child transmission. Yeah, yeah. If it's cost effective, and I'm wondering, have you thought of going in that direction? Yeah, it, it's on my list. It just didn't make that list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so okay. there, there. Uh, I need to look into a little more detail at the data, but with like. Um, uh, Habitegravir is one of them, I believe. Um, there's some concern about uh, about drug resistance, um, but it's it's likely that the benefits will outweigh the risks. Um, but that would be um, yeah. So I mentioned that it recently guidelines have changed to using um, dolutegravir, and dolutegravir has much higher rates of viral suppression, so that even if you don't have great adherence, it works well. Um, so uh, some of these interventions that I mentioned may not be quite as straightforward with dolutegravir because um, most people don't develop drug resistance. So in the case, if you fail on dolutegravir, it's possible that the, the answer might be to switch to one of these injectables that you're referring to. Yeah. That's very cool. Really excellent question. Thanks. So when we, when I thought about this previously, we also wanted to keep in mind that we're worried about the, the woman herself after the pregnancy. And so, um, especially in some of the areas in which you're most interested in, um, there are high levels of parity and shorter inter pregnancy intervals. So I'm wondering if you have future interest in looking at the woman beyond her breastfeeding years and um, in, in these intervals in which she may become pregnant again, or just in, in general ways of describing uh, her health. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So um, when I alluded to further developments to the model, um, the here I'm just starting with a cohort and saying like for this pregnancy and all these people, what happens? But the the model I'm building towards is one where you have basically all of the women in the population pregnant or not, so that essentially you can project infant infections like at a national scale. So that would include all the things that you're um, referring to. And another thing that I, I work on um, 
not with the PMTC, well, I'm working towards working <laughs> um, with the, the bigger model is that in general, so um, young women ages 15 to 24 are known to be a, a really high risk group. They have the highest HIV incidence for a number of reasons, namely that um, uh, there are some, many partnerships with older men that have a higher uh, prevalence of HIV. Men have lower rates of viral suppression overall. So there's a lot of strategies. There's a, a whole initiative called the DREAMS Initiative that has different packages of interventions to try to address this. So this is something I'm working towards trying to, to look at. Yeah. Great talk, Rosso. Thank you. Thanks. I was curious, how do you evaluate the real world effectiveness of these models? Um, you get a projection, and then is there are there examples where there are policy changes, and you can look at the number of infections at one year, five years, ten years versus what your model would have predicted, or how does that work? Yes, yeah, so you mean like how how good a job the model did at predicting? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically you have to wait until um, something. You have to wait several years to see what happens, and then compare. And then the other thing is like. The, the scenarios you modeled may not be exactly like whatever happened in real life. But so one of the things that we do, so that, that's called like model validation. And that's a little harder. That good of model validation is hard because you have to wait a long time. There's also an aspect of model calibration that you do on the front end. So I don't have a slide here, but for example, for my, for my transmission, big adult transmission model, um, in the years leading up to the start of the intervention, you want to be able to produce, reproduce like HIV prevalence, or in my case, I looked at uh, pretreatment drug resistance prevalence. So you're saying, well, in the, I don't know if it's going to predict accurately the future, but at the very least, am I able to reproduce using uh, accurate parameters? Am I able to reproduce historical trends that have already happened? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It was an amazing presentation. Really clear. Thanks. I have a question. How does it work for things that are more behavioral in nature? So, for example, I mean, I'm thinking of different areas, but in this area, like if you could prevent rapes of young women by older men, like, do people do modeling for things like yeah, that? Yeah, so or? behavioral things are a bit tricky. Really, um, what it boils down to is you're not actually modeling. The behaviors you're not representing the behaviors for the sake of a model what you care about is if you change this behavior what is it going to alter what parameter in the model will it alter so like for for example like the the mentor mother thing could kind of be considered kind of like a behavioral thing but you're not modeling the behaviors if you do this we know from studies that retention improves and adherence improves so um like with with rape, there there probably are ways to account for that in the model, but um, it's a little bit it's a little bit trickier. You have to have good enough data that you know what what the effects are. Yeah. 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 Very interesting talk. I I'm curious because I assume most of this. Uh, is uh, sub-Sahara Africa countries. Uh, and you talked about plugging in probabilities, things might happen, but you know, in, in those areas, the likelihood of quality data is probably the probably low. You know, how, how do you deal with that? It's actually pretty good. It is. Yeah, it's very, very good. Um, so I mean, it, HIV, I don't know anymore. It's, you know, there's the top three HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, HIV, well, before COVID, HIV was by far the most heavily funded infectious disease, uh, research-wise and program-wise. Um, so every country has these huge surveys that happen every few years. And um, there's uh, a ton of good data. In fact, sometimes it looks better than, I think, the US data. So HIV, and then even for like the general demographic stuff that we need that's not HIV specific, like the DHS stuff is really uh, good. So there are definitely challenges on the ground to make changes, but in terms of the data side, it's actually pretty good. And, and I'm curious, how, how common is uh, transmission in the States, assuming uh, our data are good? So the, like the, the probabilities 
a lot of this are, are sort of biological entities. So in terms of the probability stratified by viral load or whatever, um, those things don't change. The, the rates of transmission are a lot lower because um, a lot of these gaps that I showed happen a lot less here. So um, in, in babies becoming infected with HIV is very, very rare. So uh, like my pediatric ID colleagues, um, th there's not a lot of HIV work to be done because there aren't that many children here living with HIV. Yes, that was a really nice presentation, actually. Thanks. Uh, and I bet the answer to this question is that they're talking about but, uh, uh, Like I assume all these transition probabilities have a certain amount of uncertainty. Yes. Them? Are you planning on incorporating that? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no. great. It is on the list. Um, no, so uh, it's 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 something we do all the time. So there are um, so the easiest way to do it is with what's called a deterministic sensitivity analysis. So you say you have all these different parameters, and you say, hey, this was our our mean estimate for this value, but it ranges from here to here. So you say, well, what if we assume the worst case scenario, or what if we assume the best case scenario? There are also more um, probabilistic sensitivity analyses where, well, there is something called a probabilistic sensitivity analysis where you, you try to account for the uncertainty on all the parameters simultaneously. So you run the model a whole bunch of times each time and you assign a distribution to the values for each parameter. And each for each run, you draw at random from these distributions. And then that, that accounts for uh, all of the uncertainty simultaneously. There's a question that came in through the chat from Jimmy Carlucci. All right, Jimmy. <laughs> says, thank you for clearly explaining a complex methodology for investigating an equally complex real world problem. How do you deal with the interaction between interventions, i.e. mentor mothers provide retention or promote retention, which is a prerequisite for viral load testing. So do mentor mothers boost the relative impact of the viral load intervention, making it more cost-effective? All right, well, thank you, Jimmy. Thanks for joining in. Um, current load, well, you and I need to talk more about that, so I don't know. <laughs> um, right now, I don't, this does not include interaction. So basically, um, you're just <laughs> implementing both um, interventions at the same time, but I don't make any, as of now, I haven't made any assumptions about how implementing one might change the implementation uh, of the other. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> 